A Boy by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama A Boy Out of the noise of tired people working, harried with thoughts of war and lists of dead, his beauty met me like a fresh wind blowing, clean boyish beauty and high-held head. Eyes that told secrets, lips that would not tell them, fearless and shy the young unwearied eyes. Men die by millions now, because God blunders. Yet to have made this boy, he must be wise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Autumn by John Clare. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama. Autumn. Autumn comes laden with her ripened load of fruitage, and so scatters them abroad that each fern smothered heath and molehill waste are black with bramble berries, where in haste the chubby urchins from the village hie to feast them there, stained with the purple dye while painted woods around my rambles be in draperies worthy of eternity. Yet will the leaves soon patter on the ground, and death's deaf voice awake at every sound. One drops, then others, and the last that fell rings for those left behind their passing bell. Thus memory everywhere her tidings brings. How sad death robs us, of life's dearest things. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Away with Funeral Music by Robert Louis Stevenson. Read for LibriVox.org. Away with funeral music. Set the pipe to powerful lips. The cup of life's for him who drinks not. For him who sips. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Bellbirds by Henry C. Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Angela Bell in Sydney, Australia. By channels of coolness, the echoes are calling. And down the dim gorges I hear the creek falling. It lives in the mountain where moss and the sedges touch with their beauty the banks and the ledges. Through breaks of the cedar and sycamore bowers struggles the light that is love to the flowers and softer than slumber and sweeter than singing the notes of the bellbirds are running and ringing. The silver-voiced bellbirds, the darlings of daytime, they sing in September their songs of the Maytime, when shadows wax strong and the thunderbolts hurtle, they hide with their fear in the leaves of the myrtle. When rain and the sunbeam shine mingled together, they start up like fairies that follow fair weather, and straightway the hues of their feathers unfolden are the green and the purple, the blue and the golden. October, the maiden of bright yellow tresses, loiters for love in these cool wildernesses, loiters knee-deep in the grasses to listen, where dripping rocks gleam and the leafy pools glisten. Then is the time when the water moons, splendid, break with their gold and are scattered or blended over the creeks till the woodlands have warning of songs of the bellbird and wings of the morning. Welcome as waters unkissed by the summers are the voices of bellbirds to thirsty far-comers. When fiery December sets foot in the forest 
and the need of the wayfarer precious the sorest. Pent in the ridges for ever and ever, the bellbirds direct him to spring and to river. With ring and with ripple, like runnels whose torrents are toned by the pebbles and leaves in the currents. Often I sit looking back to a childhood mixed with the sights and the sounds of the wildwood. Longing for power and the sweetness to fashion lyrics with beats like the heartbeats of passion. Songs interwoven of lights and of laughters borrowed from bellbirds in far forest rafters. So I might keep in the city and alleys the beauty and strength of the deep mountain valleys, charming to slumber the pain of my losses with glimpses of creeks and a vision of mosses. End of Bell Birds. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clark Street Bridge by Carl Sandberg. Read for LibriVox.org by Kavanchatmaja, Izmir, Turkey, 2008. Dust of the feet and dust of the wheels, wagons and people going, all day feet and wheels. Now only stars and mist, a lonely policeman. Two cabaret dancers, stars and mist again. No more feet or wheels, no more dust and wagons. Voices of dollars and drops of blood. Voices of broken hearts, voices singing, singing. Silver voices, singing, softer than the stars softer than the mist. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Damp by John Donne Read for LibriVox.org by Jessica Louise When I am dead, and doctors know not why, and my friend's curiosity will have me cut up to survey each part, when they shall find your picture in my heart, you think a sudden damp of love will through all their senses move, and work on them as me, and so prefer your murder to the name of massacre? Poor victories! But if you dare be brave, and pleasure in your conquest have, first kill the enormous giant your disdain, and let the enchantress honor next be slain. And like a goth and vandal, rise, deface records and histories of your own arts and triumphs over men. And without such advantage, kill me then. For I could muster up as well as you my giants and my witches too, which are vast constancy and secretness. But these I neither look for nor profess. Kill me as woman. Let me die as a mere man. Do you but try your passive valor, and you shall find then, naked, you have odds enough of any man. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Day for Wandering by Clinton Scollard Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon I set apart a day for wandering. I heard the woodlands ring, the hidden white throats sing, and the harmonic west, beyond a far hill crest, touch its aeolian string. Remote from all the brawl and brute of men, the iron tongue of trade, I followed the clear calling of a wren, deep to the bosom of a sheltered glade, where interwoven branches spread a shade, of soft cooled barrel like the evening seas, unruffled by the breeze and there and there i watched the maiden hair the pale blue iris grass the water spider in its paws and pass upon a pool that like a mirror was 
I took for confident the diligent ant, threading the clover and the sorrel aisles. For me were all the smiles of the sequestered blossoms there bloom, chalice and crown and plume. I drank the ripe, rich attars, blurred and blent, and won, content. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dedication by Lola Ridge. Read for LibriVox.org by Shona Brogdon Sturble. To my mother. Let me cradle myself back into the darkness of the half shapes of the called beginnings. Let me stir the attar of unused air, elusive. Ironically fragrant as a dead queen's kerchief. Let me blow the dust from off you. Resurrect your breath, lying limp as a fan in a dead queen's hand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Despairing Lover by William Walsh Read for LibriVox.org by Philippa Distracted with care for Phyllis the fair, Since nothing could move her, poor Damon, her lover, Resolves in despair no longer to languish Nor bear so much anguish, But mad with his love, to a precipice goes, Where a leap from above would soon finish his woes. When in rage he came there, Beholding how steep the sides did appear, and the bottom how deep, his torments projecting and sadly reflecting that a lover forsaken a new love may get, but a neck when once broken can never be set, and that he could die whenever he would, but that he could live but as long as he could, how grievous soever his torment might grow, he scorned to endeavour to finish it so. But bold, unconcerned at thoughts of the pain, he calmly returned to his cottage again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oh, how I love on a fair summer's eve by John Keats, read for LibriVox.org by Sergio Baldelli in Rome, August 2008. Oh, how I love, on a fair summer's eve, when streams of light pour down the golden west, and on the balmy zephyrs tranquil rest the silver clouds, far, far away to leave all meaner thoughts, and take sweet reprieve from little cares, to find with easy quest a fragrant wild with the nature's beauty dressed, and there into delight my soul deceive. There warm my breast with the patriotic law, Musing on Milton's fate, on Sydney's beer, Till their stern forms before my mind arise. Perhaps on the wing of a poesy upsaw, Full often dropping a delicious tear, When some melodious sorrow spells mine eyes. End of a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fire and Ice by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a friend who sent me some roses by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Sergio Baldelli in Rome, September 2008 
A slate I rambled in the happy fields, What time the skylark shakes the tremulous dew From his lush clover covert, When a new adventurous knights Take up their dinted shields, I saw the sweetest flower wild nature yields. A fresh blown musk rose, Twas the first that threw its sweets upon the summer, Graceful it grew, as is the wand that Queen Titania wields, And, as I feasted on its fragrancy, I thought the garden rose it far excelled. But when, O oh Wells, thy roses came to me, My sense with their deliciousness was spelled. Soft voices had they, that with a tender plea Whispered of peace and truth and friendliness unquelled. End of a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Good Morrow by John Donne Read for LibriVox.org by Julie van Walchem I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. Were we not weaned till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly? Or snorted we in the seven sleepers then? Toss so, but this all pleasures fancies be, if ever any beauty I did see which I desired and got, Twas but a dream of thee. And now, good morrow to our waking souls, Which watch not one another out of fear, For love all love of other sides controls, And makes one little room in everywhere. That sea discoverers to new worlds have come, That maps to other worlds on worlds have shown, let us possess one world, each hath one and is one. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears, And true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres Without sharp north, without declining west? Whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one, or thou and I Love so alike that none can slacken, None can die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Good night by P. B. Shelley. Read for LibriVox.org. Good night? Ah, no. The ah is ill which severs those it should unite. Let us remain together still, then will be a good night. How can I call the lone night good, though thy sweet wishes wing its flight? Be it not said, thought, understood, that it will be a good night, to hearts which near each other move from evening close to morning light. The night is good, because, my love, they never say good night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Harbor by Carl Sandberg. Read for LibriVox by Kavanch Atmaja, Izmir, Turkey, 2008 Passing through huddled and ugly walls By doorways where women looked from their hunger-deep eyes Haunted with shadows of hunger hands Out from the huddled and ugly walls I came sudden at the city's edge On a blue burst of lake Long lake waves breaking under the sun On a spray-flung curve of shore And a fluttering storm of gulls Masses of great gray wings And flying white bellies Wearing and wheeling free in the open End of poem This recording 
is in the public domain. Odes of Horace, Book 4, Number 7, translated by Samuel Johnson, read for LibriVox.org, by Michael Dalling. The snow dissolved, no more is seen, the fields and woods, behold, are green. The changing year renews the plain, the rivers know their banks again. The sprightly nymph and naked grace, the mazy dance together trace, the changing year's successive plan, Proclaims mortality to man. Rough winter's blasts to spring give way, Spring yields to summer's sovereign ray, Then summer sinks in autumn's rain, And winter chills the world again. Her losses soon the moon supplies, But wretched man, when once he lies, Where Priam and his sons are laid, Is naught but ashes and a shade. Who knows if Jove, who counts our score, Will toss us in a morning more, what with your friend you nobly share, at least you rescue from your heir. Not you, Torquatus, boast of Rome, when Minos once has fixed your doom, or eloquence, or splendid birth, or virtue shall replace on earth. Hippolytus, unjustly slain, Diana called us to life in vain, nor can the might of Theseus rend the chains of hell that hold his friend. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Am by John Clare Read for LibriVox.org by Matt I am, yet what I am, none cares or knows. My friends forsake me like a memory lost. I am the self-consumer of my woes. They rise and vanish in oblivious host, Like shades in love and death's oblivion lost. And yet I am and live with shadows tossed, Into the nothingness of scorn and noise, Into the living sea of waking dreams, Where there is neither sense of life nor joys, But the vast shipwreck of life's esteems, And even the dearest, that I loved the best, Are strange, Nay, rather stranger than the rest. I long for scenes where man has never trod, A place where woman never smiled or wept, There to abide with my Creator, God, And sleep as I in childhood sweetly slept, Untroubling and untroubled, where I lie, The grass below, above the vaulted sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Am by Valterine de Clare Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman I am, the ages on the ages roll, And what I am I was and I shall be, By slow growth filling higher destiny, And widening ever to the widening goal. I am the stone that slept, down deep in me that old, old sleep Has left its century in trace. I am the plant that dreamed, And lo, still see that dream life Dwelling on the human face. I slept, I dreamed, I wakened, I am man. The hut grows palaces, The depths breathe light, Still on, forms pass, but form yields kinglier might. The singer, dying where his song began, In me yet lives, and yet again Shall he unseal the lips of greater songs to be, For mine the thousand tongues of immortality. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Life by Francis Bacon Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Robinson, Carbondale, Illinois The world's a bubble, 
and the life of man less than a span. In his conception wretched from the womb, so to the tomb. Cursed from his cradle and brought up to years with cares and fears, who then to frail mortality shall trust, but limbs on water, or but rites in dust. Yet whilst with sorrow here we live oppressed, what life is best? Courts are but only superficial schools to dandle fools. The rural parts are turned into a den of savage men. And where's a city from foul vice so free but may be termed the worst of all the three? Domestic cares afflict the husband's bed or pains his head. Those that live single take it for a curse or do things worse. Some would have children. Those that have them moan or wish them gone. What is it, then, to have or have no wife but single thraldom or a double strife? But our affections still at home to please is a disease. To cross the seas to any foreign soil, peril and toil. Wars with their noise affright us. When they cease, we are worse in peace. What then remains, but that we still should cry for being born, or being born to die? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mending Wall by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair, where they have left not one stone on stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding, to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day, we meet to walk the line, and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each, and some are loaves and some so nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to little more. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder, if I could put a notion in his head, why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top, in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness as it seems to me not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mourn Not the Dead by Ralph Chaplin Read for LibriVox.org by Jeremiah Britt Mourn not the dead that in the cool earth lie, dust unto dust, the calm, sweet earth that mothers all who die, as all men must. Mourn not your captive comrades who must dwell, too strong to strive, within each steel-bound coffin of a cell, buried alive but rather mourn the apathetic throng, 
the cowed, and the meek, who see the world's great anguish and its wrong, and dare not speak. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. October by Robert Frost. Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Cheng. O hushed October morning mild, thy leaves have ripened to the fall. Tomorrow's wind, if it be wild, should waste them all. The crows above the forest call. Tomorrow they may form and go. O hushed October morning mild, begin the hours of this day slow. Make the day seem to us less brief. Hearts not averse to being beguiled, Beguile us in the way you know. Release one leaf at break of day, At noon release another leaf, One from our trees, one far away. Retard the sun with gentle mist, Enchant the land with amethyst. Slow, slow, for the grape's sake, if they were all, Whose leaves already are burnt with frost, Whose clustered fruit must else be lost. For the grape's sake, along the wall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org By David Fetterman Once upon a midnight dreary, While I pondered, weak and weary, Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, While I nodded nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, As of someone gently rapping, Rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. "'Only this, and nothing more. "'Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, "'and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. "'Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow "'from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow, for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And this silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating. "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, "'some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'This is it, and nothing more. "'Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. "'But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping.' And so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? And this I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, Surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. 
Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the placid bus spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master, Whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, Till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, Of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling, all my fancy into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned in my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff, this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, Thing of evil, Prophet still, if bird or devil, Whether tempter sent, Or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, Desolate yet all undaunted, On this desert land enchanted, On this home by horror haunted, Tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil. By that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if... Within the distant Aden, 
it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Remember by Christina Rossetti. Read for LibriVox.org by Shalifa Mulligan. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no more hold me by the hand, nor I half turn to go, yet turning stay. Remember me when no more day by day you tell me of our future that you planned. Only remember me. You understand it will be late to counsel then or pray. Yet if you should forget me for a while, and afterwards remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that once I had, better by far you should forget and smile than that you should remember and be sad. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Seed Time and Harvest by John Greenleaf Whittier Read for LibriVox.org by Ian Hatley Seed Time and Harvest As o'er his failed fields will slide Beneath a cold we drops in sky Yet chill with winter's melted snow, the husbandman goes forth to sow. Thus freedom on the bitter blast, the ventures of thy seed we cast, and trust the warmer sun and rain, to swell the germs and fill the grain. Who calls thy glory its servants hard? Who deems it not its own reward? Who for its trials counts it less, and the cause of praise and thankfulness? It may not be our lot to yield, the sack on the ripened field, nor are to hear on summer eves the reaper's song among the sheaves. Yet where our duty's task is wrought, in unison with God's great thought, the near and future blend in one, and whatsoever is willed is done. And ours the grateful service whence comes day by day the recompense, the hope, the trust, the purpose stay, the fountain and noonday shade. And were this night the most span, though we end in the aim of man, better the toil of fields like these, than walk and dream in slothful ease. But life, though fond like a grain, like that revives and springs again, and I recalled how birds are they who wait in heaven their harvest day. This recording is in the public domain. Sylvia by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Robinson, Carbondale, Illinois Who is Sylvia? 
what is she that all our swains commend her? Holy, fair, and wise is she, the heaven such grace did lend her that she may admired be. Is she kind as she is fair? For beauty lives with kindness. Love doth to her eyes repair to help him of his blindness, and, being helped, inhabits there. Then to Sylvia let us sing that Sylvia is excelling. She excels each mortal thing upon the dull earth dwelling. To her let us garlands bring. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Song Against Grocers by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Tracy Yonemoto September 2008 God made the wicked grocer for a mystery and a sign that men might shun the awful shops and go to inns to dine where the bacon's on the rafter and the wine is in the wood and God that made good laughter has seen that they are good. The evil-hearted grocer would call his mother man, and bow at her and bob at her, her aged soul to damn, and rub his horrid hands and ask what article was next, though mortis in articulo should be her proper text. His props are not his children, but pert lads underpaid, who call out cash and bang about to work his wicked trade. He keeps a lady in a cage most cruelly all day, and makes her count and calls her miss until she fades away. The righteous minds of innkeepers induce them now and then to crack a bottle with a friend or treat unmoneyed men. But who hath seen the grocer treat housemaids to his teas, or crack a bottle of fish sauce, or stand a man a cheese? He sells his sands of Araby as sugar for cash down. He sweeps his shop and sells the dust, the purest salt in town. He crams with cans of poisoned meat the subjects of the king, and when they die by thousands, why, he laughs like anything. The wicked grocer groches, in spirits and in wine, not frankly and in fellowship, as men in inns do dine, but packed with soap and sardines, and carried off by grooms, for to be snatched by duchesses, and drunk in dressing-rooms. The hell-instructed grocer has a temple made of tin, and the ruin of good innkeepers is loudly urged therein. But now the sands are running out, from sugar of a sort. The grocer trembles, for his time, just like his weight, is short. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Sonnet of the Moon by Charles Best Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman Look how the pale queen of the silent night Doth cause the ocean to attend upon her. And he, as long as she is in his sight, With her full tide is ready her to honor. But when the silver wagon of the moon Is mounted up so high he cannot follow, The sea calls home his crystal waves to moan and with low ebb doth manifest his sorrow. So you that are the sovereign of my heart have all my joys attending on your will, my joys low ebbing when you do depart. When you return, their tide my heart doth fill. So as you come and as you do depart, Joys ebb and flow within my tender heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sun Up by Lola Ridge. Read for LibriVox.org by Shona Brogdon Sturble. Shadows over a cradle. Firelight craning. A hand throws something in the fire, and a smaller hand runs into the flame and out again, singed and empty.
Shadows settling over a cradle. Two hands and a fire. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Autumn by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Dalling Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness Close bosom friend of the maturing sun Conspiring with him how to load and bless With fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run To bend with apples the mossed cottage trees And fill all fruit with ripeness to the core To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells With a sweet kernel to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has all brimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while they hook, spares the next swath, and all its twined flowers, and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep, steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a side oppress with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too, while barred clouds bloom the soft dying day, and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn, among the river sallows borne aloft, or sinking as the light wind lives or dies, and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bourn, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Trees by Joyce Kilmer Read for LibriVox.org by Jerry Dixon Trees I think that I shall never see A poem as lovely as a tree A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed Against the sweet earth's hungry breast A tree that looks at God all day And lifts her leafy arms to pray A tree that may in summer wear A nest of robins in her hair Upon whose bosom snow has lain who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tom Corby's by Anonymous. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean O'Hara. As I was walking all alone, I heard Tom Corby's making a main, the tain unto the say, where else have we gang and dine to-day? In behind yon old fell dyke, I wot there lies a new slain knight, And nobody kens that he lies there, But his hawk is hound and lady fair. His hound is the hunting gain, His hawk to fetch the wild fowl hame. His lady's ta'en another mate, So we may make our dinner sweet. You'll sit on this white house bane, And I'll pike out his bonny blue een, we a lock of his golden hair, We'll seek our nest when it grows bare. Money a one for him makes main, But nane shall ken where he is gain. O'er his white banes, when they are bare, the winds shall blow forever mare. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Untitled Poem by Sir John Suckling Read for LibriVox.org by Jessica Louise That none beguiled be by time's quick flowing Lovers have in their hearts a clock still going. For though time be nimble, his motions are quicker, and thicker where love hath his notions. Hope is the mainspring on which moves desire, and these do the less wheels, fear, joy, inspire. The balance is thought evermore clicking and striking, and ne'er giving o'er. Occasions the hand which stills moving round, Till by it the critical hour may be found. And when that falls out, it will strike kisses, 
Strange Blisses, and What You Best Like. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.